Hello everyone, and welcome to another video. I've made several videos about Ryzen 4000 laptops, and they became relatively popular. Now that Ryzen 5000 laptops are out, and I have my hands on a very good one, let's check them out. This is going to be a long video, so feel free to skip the chapters that you're not interested in. Please consider subscribing so I can make more videos. The full name of this laptop is Gigabyte A5X1. Well, I didn't know Gigabyte made laptops. We'll talk more about that in a bit. It's also sold as the XMG Apex 15. What's impressive about it is the specs. It has an 8-core, 16-thread AMD Ryzen 9 5900HX with a base clock of 3.3GHz, a boost clock of 4.6GHz, and a total cache of 20MB. We'll see whether it can reach that boost clock, and if so, for how long. On top of that, it is an NVIDIA RTX 3070 graphics unit. While it might have been better to pair up the processor with a 3080, RTX 3080 laptops are rare and they're quite expensive, so I don't blame Gigabyte for that. Either way, we'll see if the GPU bottlenecks the CPU. It comes with 16 gigabytes of 3200 MHz RAM in dual channel. It's nice to see that manufacturers finally figured out that it makes much more sense to pair up a Ryzen processor with dual channel memory. It also has 512 gigabytes of NVMe SSD, Wi-Fi 6, and Bluetooth 5.2. On the screen side, we have a 15.6 inch Full HD display with a refresh rate of 240Hz. I looked up the panel serial number online and it seems like it's made by Acer Optronics and it has a peak brightness of 300 nits. What's more interesting is that when I looked up the panel serial number, I realized that the refresh rate, instead of being 240Hz as advertised, was 300Hz. So I wanted to test it out. I downloaded Custom Resolution Utility, which is a program that allows you to create custom resolutions with specific frame rates, and it adds them to your Windows display settings. When I tried that, I could not get the full 300Hz, but I easily managed to get 260. So I believe that this panel is indeed rated at 300Hz, but either the display link is not rated at 300Hz, or this is some kind of B-stock that can't do 300, but it can do 240. Either way, I really like these high refresh rate displays. The display definitely looks brighter than 300 nits. Unless I use a MacBook, I keep the brightness of my laptop always at 100%. With this one, I never needed to do that, I usually keep it around 70%. The reason for this is that it has a matte panel. As a result, you don't get as much glare. It covers 100% of the sRGB color gamut, and I had no issues editing videos. That being said, my unit has some backlight bleed issues, especially on top left. I'm going to contact Gigabyte about this issue, and we'll see what they're gonna respond. And with this, let's move on to the design and build quality. This laptop currently sells for 1750 Canadian dollars, and with these specs, it's obvious that they had to cut corners somewhere. Material quality is one of them. This laptop, despite being advertised as a high-end laptop, is all plastic. For some reason, they went for glossy plastic on surfaces that you frequently touch, and as a direct result, they show elbow grease as well as fingerprints. We see some fake carbon fiber on the sides as well as on the lid assembly. Despite being all plastic, the build quality is quite good. There is very little screen flex and virtually no keyboard flex. Even the bottom cover does not flex. We see the Gigabyte logo on the lid as well as right underneath the screen. They are both printed. I initially thought this was a way of cost cutting, but that's not entirely true. We'll talk about that in just a bit. Similar to the Lenovo Legion that I tested, this looks more like a workstation than a gaming laptop. I certainly like a laptop that I can take to work or to a cafe. The edges of the laptop are on the sharper side and they might hurt your legs depending on your position. The keyboard is RGB backlit, but as it only has one zone, you can't have the rainbow lighting effect and you can't light up certain parts of the keyboard. Keyflex is comparable to other laptops that I tested. I'm not a huge fan of the font they use for the legend, but regardless, it's legible. I have a couple of issues with this keyboard though. First up, look at the keyboard of the HP Pavilion gaming laptop that I tested around two years ago. And now, look at the keyboard of this laptop. They chose the worst way of adding a numpad to this keyboard by shifting the arrow keys past the enter key. Moreover, they shrunk the right shift key. As a natural result, whenever I want to use the right shift key, I end up pressing the up arrow. And when I want to press the right arrow, 
I end up pressing the down arrow. I've been using this laptop for a couple weeks now, and I've yet to get used to it. Secondly, although I like the way keys actuate, I sometimes find myself missing keystrokes. This is partially because the keycaps are a bit too slippery for my taste, and I feel like some keys have more resistance than others. This will get better over time. Other than that, despite the issues that I mentioned, I like typing on this keyboard. You can easily change the backlight brightness as well as the color by either opening up the control center or using the dedicated keys. Below the keyboard, we have the trackpad, and this is among the most no frills trackpads that I've ever seen. It's a Windows Precision trackpad as it's required by Windows 11. It's also decently sized. They went for dedicated left and right click buttons, and I feel like this is out of necessity. The trackpad simply isn't sensitive enough, so you will need those buttons. I'm normally okay with laptop trackpads, but with this one, I choose to use a mouse. The included 49 watt hour battery is detachable, which is a surprise in 2022. It lasts around 2 hours under normal use, which is abysmal, but it is understandable as it's a gaming laptop. There's a 720p webcam, and to my surprise, it's quite decent. With a decent built-in microphone, this laptop is certainly not bad for Zoom or Teams calls. I've been using mine for daily scrums for the last two weeks or so, and people have had no problems hearing or seeing me. However, I did have a hard time hearing them because of the speakers. Yes, there are two of them, but they're bottom firing, so unless you put it on a stand, you're gonna have a hard time hearing what's happening. I should add a disclaimer here. I mentioned that this laptop currently sells for 1750 Canadian dollars. At the time of filming, the second cheapest laptop with similar specs, the ASUS ROG Strix G17, sells for 2000 Canadian dollars. And that laptop is not perfect either. With that, let's move on to the ports. On the back, we have a 2.5 gigabit Ethernet port, an HDMI 2.0 port, a mini display port, as well as a USB C Gen 2 port. Normally, I'm not a huge fan of ports on the back, but it's logical that they put those ports there as they're all meant for a desktop setup. On the left side, we have a barrel port for charging and two USB 3 ports. On the right side, we have two separate jacks for headphones and microphones, as well as a USB 2.0 port. I appreciate Gigabyte for choosing to put two types of USB 3.2 Gen 2 ports. On the other hand, I say this in pretty much every single video about laptops, get rid of the USB 2 port put a USB 3 Gen 1 instead. Also, I wouldn't say no to an SD card reader either. Before we start benchmarking, let's talk about who manufactures this laptop. You might be tempted to say, well, it's Gigabyte, duh. And that would make sense considering Gigabyte already manufactures motherboards, graphics cards, etc. But nope, this laptop is not made by Gigabyte. Instead, it's made by an ODM called Claybo. It comes with an almost stuck installation of Windows 11 Home. The only included software is Control Center, which is used to change the fan curves as well as keyboard settings. It is not an elegant piece of software, but it's not clunky either. It certainly gets the job done. It also doesn't check for driver updates or BIOS updates. Mine came with an outdated BIOS and it received one more BIOS update since I got it, so it's best to check regularly. Okay, let's start benchmarking. All tests are done in performance setting both for Windows and for Control Center. In Cinebench, we see that things have changed for AMD. While the 5900HX outperforms its predecessor by 16% in single core and 23% in multi core, it falls behind the 12th gen Intel CPUs, even the i5 12500H. Comparing the 5900HX and the 12500H, we see that the latter performs around 9% better in single core and around 3% in multi-core. We see the big difference when we compare it with the i9-12900H. 28% better in single core and 20% better in multi-core. That's quite the difference. When I made videos about Ryzen 4000 laptops, we used to see this kind of difference, but AMD was the better performer. It's nice to see some real competition between Intel and AMD, ultimately it benefits the customer. 
Looking at PC Mark 10, we see some inconsistencies. In productivity, we see the 5900HX outperforming the rest of the AMD stack, and interestingly, the i9-12900H. I ran these tests multiple times to rule out any inconsistencies, and the results you see are the averages. The 12500H and the 12700H perform around 5% better than the 5900HX. The inconsistencies continue with digital content creation. The i7 12700H performs around 9% better than the 5900HX, however, we see the 5900HX outperforming the i9 12900H as well as the i5 12500H. I assume PC Mark 10 isn't fully ready for the 12th gen Intel processors yet. Using Handbrake, we then converted a 1200MB 4K 30fps video to a 1080p MKV using the YouTube preset. And we see results similar to Cinebench multicore runs, as Handbrake favors hardcore and thread counts. The 5900HX performs around 7% better than Intel's previous benchmark, the i9-11900H. However, it falls behind the 12th gen Intel stack, even the i5-12500H. Exporting in Premiere Pro is a demanding task for both the CPU and the GPU, so let's check that out. On my SSD, I have a 10.5 minute 4K project with audio, some graphics, as well as some effects. So let's compare the export performance. First up, thanks to QuickSync, Intel CPUs often do better than their AMD counterparts. While the 5900HX performs quite well compared to other AMD processors, especially the 4900H, it falls behind the Intel stack significantly. The 5900HX takes 61% longer to complete the export than the i9-12900H. Before we check out gaming, let's have a look at 3 Mark. Graphics is fairly GPU intensive, while physics relies on the CPU. Looking at graphics, thanks to the RTX 3070, we see the Gigabyte performing better than the rest of our stack, except the RTX 3070 Ti's found on two of our laptops. Looking at physics, we see the 5900HX catching up. While it performs 15% worse than the i9-12900H, it is pretty much on par with the rest of the Intel stack. It naturally performs better than the other AMD laptops. And with that, let's move on to gaming. We start with CSGO. At 287 FPS, we naturally see our Gigabyte performing better than the rest of the AMD stack as they have 3050 or 3060s. On the other hand, despite only having a 3050 Ti, we see the 12500H outperforming the Gigabyte. In Cyberpunk, at 1080p high with Ray Tracing Ultra, we see that none of the laptops on our stack can keep up with the LSS off. Nevertheless, the Gigabyte gets 36 frames on average, which is 27 to 40% better than the rest of the AMD stack. Again, understandable as they have inferior graphic units. Unlike CSGO, we see the 3050Ti paired with the 11900H fall behind our Gigabyte by 10%. RTX 3070Ti paired with the 12700H or the 12900H outperforms this laptop. With the LSS on, we see playable frame rates, but we still can't take full advantage of our high refresh rate screen. Cyberpunk is quite a demanding game, and even the LSS can't fully save it. With the same settings I mentioned, our Gigabyte gets an average of 95 FPS, which is close to what the top of the Intel stack gets. Far Cry 5 is another game where the Gigabyte can save some phase. At 1080p high, we averaged 121 FPS, which is only 4% worse than the i9-12900H RTX 3070 Ti combo, and it's on par with the i7-12700H. Far Cry favors AMD processors, which can explain why we see these results. Shadow of the Tomb Raider shows us a similar scenario. We average 84 FPS at 1080p high, which is once again much better than the rest of the AMD stack. This time, Despite falling behind the i9-11900H and the i9-12900H, the Gigabyte outperformed the i7-12700H as well as the i5-12500H. Laptops like this have two graphics units, the integrated AMD one and the discrete RTX 3070. There are two approaches to this. Either the display is connected to the integrated graphics while the discrete graphics may do some of the work when necessary, or there is a physical switch that changes which graphics unit the display is connected to. That is called a MUX switch. This laptop does not have a MUX switch, so its display is always connected to the AMD graphics, and when you're playing a game, 
the calculations and the rendering is done by the discrete unit and then it's transferred to the integrated unit which displays what's supposed to be displayed. In this case, as the integrated graphics unit is in the way, that might affect the performance. An easy way to see the performance difference is to connect the laptop to an external display because external displays are directly connected to the discrete graphics unit. And that's exactly what I did to see the difference. In 3D Mark Firestrike, we see that the graphics score is 8% higher, so there is a difference. We see a more modest increase in Shadow of the Tomb Raider from 84 to 88 frames per second. On the other hand, Cyberpunk pretty much stayed the same with or without the LSS. So you might get a bit more performance by connecting an external display. Can the GPU be overclocked? Technically, yes. GeForce Experience suggested a 75% overclock on the GPU clock, but I was able to get 175 MHz on the GPU clock and 1000 MHz on the memory. Well, these numbers show a couple things. First up, you can get a 2-7% to increase in performance in games and other graphics intensive tasks. And secondly, GeForce Experience plays it really safe a 75 MHz overclock is not a big difference. Let's move to the thermals now. I usually use this laptop in performance fan mode and the CPU idles at around 48 degrees while the GPU does so at around 42. Under an all-core ADA64 CPU stress test, the CPU jumps to 99 degrees and stays there throughout the test. This is quite normal for a laptop. In terms of CPU frequency, after an initial boost of 4.2 GHz, it stays at around 3.8 GHz throughout the test with occasional spikes. Power use of the CPU stays constant at 45 watts throughout the stress test. One small issue I noticed here is that there is a delay to the fan speed. As you can see in the beginning of the stress test, the CPU quickly reaches 99 degrees, but the fans start spinning a couple seconds later. This becomes more apparent when you manually set the fans to spin at 100%. Not only does the initial boost last longer, Overall, it managed to keep a higher frequency. When the GPU is under load, it quickly jumps to 60 degrees before the fans kick in. Clock speeds stay around 1800 MHz until the GPU reaches 80 degrees, at which point we settle around 1750 MHz. Power use of the GPU is at 140 watts throughout the test. Overall, this laptop, in my opinion, has a good place in the market right now. For the price, you get a CPU that falls behind the latest 12th gen Intel processors, but a GPU that makes up for it. The build quality is decent, the screen is pretty good aside from the backlight bleed I mentioned, and it makes a good workstation as well as a gaming laptop. Thank you so much for watching, please consider liking this video if you liked it, checking out my other videos, and subscribing to my channel. Take care.